This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles by Leslie Heron. Chapter 20, Sir Tandra. Berg, put that down! Atticus strained to get out his words as he wrestled with his robot for control of a small wooden crate. You just got out and made the surgery. You should be resting. Piper had watched her brother chastise the machine for the last hour. It was a fruitless battle, as Berg seemed hell-bent on returning order to the half-destroyed hangar that acted as Atticus's home and workshop. She sighed and leaned further over the table, resting her head in her hands. At least she could keep an eye on the boy here. Berg gave the box a sharp shake as he lifted it high in the air, causing Atticus to lose his grip. Nonsense, sir. I'm fully capable of doing my daily routines. She continued to watch as her brother fussed over his robot. He had gone back to his normal, bubbly self as if the entire ordeal of his friend nearly dying had never happened. She had also worried that the callous treatment from her teacher would have left him scarred or forced him to retreat into his own mind. But no. As soon as they had returned to the hangar, he had praised the Inquisitor for helping get Berg back on his feet. Or wheel, as the case may be. The sound of the main door opening pulled Piper from the stupor she had fallen in. She turned to see Vel making his way around the piles of junk and rubble to reach her. The expression he wore was none too encouraging. She sucked in a deep breath to brace herself. Well? Mel sighed, pushing his hands into his coat pockets. No luck. Chester wouldn't take the bait. Piper's brow furrowed. Why not? With the portal machine broken, we can't escape through it. That's what I told him. Apparently, even though the machine was destroyed... The Inquisitor is already rebuilding it. And for some reason, Jester doesn't feel safe having his mole slow the process down again. Piper gave Berg a sidelong glance. If the robot was indeed the spy, his absence from Elias' side could explain Chester's sudden reluctance to halt the project. It wasn't that he didn't want to, he couldn't. Bell gave a cynical smile. He was, in his own words magnanimous enough to extend our deadline by 24 hours. Oh, a whole day? Piper exclaimed in mock astonishment. She shoved her chair away from the table in anger, allowing it to fall to the ground with a clatter that echoed off the high ceiling. I certainly hope we didn't sprain something from such a generous act. She spat on the ground. Vel scratched at his stubble. I think it's time we face facts. Time's up. We gotta get you and your brother out of here. Piper gave a half-hearted nod. What about you? One thing at a time, kid. I'll worry about me once you two are safe. Vel fell into a moment of silence. How far was Chester's reach? Would smuggling them out of the city be enough to save them, or put them farther into harm's way? Do you know how to get to the docks from down here? Piper shrugged. Yeah... But I don't recommend it. Chester's bound to have someone watching our every move down here. Vel nodded. Oh, I know. I spotted at least one guy following me on my way back. It's apparent that he doesn't trust us. We can try open the aviary district again? Vel shook his head. Remember the lifts? The ones going to the port had the tightest security. They wouldn't even let us through the gate, pass or no pass. You have to be a citizen. Piper looked over her shoulder at her brother. He was now engaged in a game of tug-of-war with the machine, each pulling against either sleeve of an old work shirt. Atticus, weighing far less, was simply skidding along the ground as Berg made his way towards the laundry room. Piper gave a sad smile. Okay. Just me and you, though. I don't want to risk my brother getting caught until we've had everything sorted. In truth, she didn't want to bring Atticus because there was no way she was going to separate him from his friend right now, and she still wasn't sure if Berg could be trusted. Bell nodded his head in agreement and motioned with his hand towards the door. Piper held up a finger and walked over towards the guard who was currently snoring as he sat sentry in a chair by the door. 
Oi, you! Al smacked his lips and cracked a single eye in her direction. Piper thrust a thumb towards Atticus. Can you keep an eye on me, brother? Grandad and I got to run an errand. Alphonse blinked a few times, slowly letting the words sink in. He rubbed a hand against his face and the haze began to drift away. He opened his mouth to reply when the sound of ripping fabric echoed through the silence. He looked over in time to see the boy toppling end over end into heaps of half-finished projects and materials, a severed shirt sleeve clutched tightly in one hand. Al turned his attention back to the girl, and with a resigned sigh, he nodded. Of course, Mom. I always do. As the pair made their way through the city to the No Guard District, it became glaringly obvious that Vel had been correct. They were being followed. The young man that darted in and out of the shadows behind them would do his best to act nonchalant any time they turned to look in his direction. Piper rolled her eyes. Just as organization has gone downhill since I left, back in my day, I could tell a mark for hours and never once get half a glance. She jerked her head in the stalker's direction. What you want to do about our little lost puppy back there? Vel gave her a flat look. Maybe Chester's organization isn't as far gone as you think. The guy's not alone. Pepper looked around the busy street behind them. Everyone seemed fully engrossed in their own business. She couldn't pick out any clear signs of a tail. Are you sure you're not just paranoid? Maybe, but that rickshaw driver up there has passed over six different fares and keeps turning up on whatever street we're on. Piper's eyes widened with surprise as she spotted a middle-aged man in dirty clothes pulling an empty cart behind him. She got him giving the barest glance in their direction, and she turned to give Vel an appraising look. Seriously? I've never thought to shadow someone from in front before. Awesome expert, able to spot a tail, and good enough to pickpocket a thief. Is there something about your past you ain't telling me? His cheeks flushed with color. Actually, he hadn't been the one to spot the rickshaw driver. After he had noticed the kid following him back to the hangar, Vil had tasked his AI with analyzing everyone they passed for suspicious activity. After a few dozen alerts of petty larceny at the local merchant stalls, the damn voice in his head had finally spotted something noteworthy. I'm not too worried about the guy behind us. He looks like he'd get lost in a room with one door. But that one up there, he could be a problem. Any suggestions? Piper shrugged. Troy and news him in a crowd? Vel looked around. It was another busy market day for the patrons of this level of the city, bustling with shoppers and working girls, all swirling around the many stalls and storefronts like a living river. The problem was that most of the individuals in this crowd were a full head height shorter than he was, not to mention the fact that he was wearing a unique jacket that went down past his knees. Unfortunately, red isn't a great camouflage color. She seemed to have come to the same conclusion. I'm open to suggestions. Maybe. One sec. Well turned his head to the side and lifted his hand to his mouth, mumbling in an attempt to keep Piper from hearing. Computer, run escape route assistance program. Command unclear. Please repeat. Vil frowned and mumbled slightly louder. Activate escape route assistance program? Piper glanced at the cyborg, a frown developing on her brow. You okay over there? Command unclear. Please repeat. Fine! Vil blurted. Get me the hell out of here! Piper gave him a concerned look. What on earth are you on about? Command accepted. Recalculating route. Vel took a deep breath, trying to calm his rising blood pressure. Nothing. Just get ready to run. Are you daft? That's a horrible... Ten left. Twenty feet. Vel bolted from the spot, hauling the girl with him. He shouldered his way through the crowd before ducking into a small alcove just behind a tent. It took Piper a moment to catch her feet then almost lost her balance again as the cyborg tugged her into a barely visible alley to their left. 
Are you sure running is the best idea? They might think we're trying to make a break for it. No, they won't, Bell called back. Not with Atticus. Back at home. Turn left. Fifteen feet. Upon exiting the alley, they were forced to duck under a large tent and then vault over a table of worn wares, shoving past a harried-looking merchant. Turn right. Twenty-five feet. Before they even made it to the next turn, they heard a crash behind them. Vel looked over his shoulder to see the young man flat on his ass, having caught himself as he tried to clear a shoe display and instead pulled the whole stall down. They zipped around the corner and continued to sprint full out. Piper's legs were shorter and were starting to cramp. Her chest burned between heaving lungfuls of acrid air, but she managed to just keep up. You're going to get us lost, old man. Mel shook his head, calling back through heavy breaths. I know what I'm doing. Turn right, 17 feet. How? Because the AI stuck in my head mapped the city as we walked through it earlier, was what he wanted to say. Deciding against the lengthy explanation, he opted for, I have a good sense of direction, I suppose. Turn right, 21 feet. As they burst onto a busy street, Vel skidded to a halt as he nearly collided with the man he had seen pulling the rickshaw. Piper continued forward, stumbling and smacking right into the man's broad chest. He looked down at her with a cruel grin and grasped her by the arm. Correction, turn left. Recalculating. Up close, the brute of a man became more imposing. The layers of grime and smell came from a haphazard application of dirt and stale booze, lending to his disguise. He might look like a vagrant, but up close it was obvious he was anything but. His hair, while messy, was well-groomed. His dirty, ripped clothes had once been well-tailored and made of fine cloth. Even his boots looked fairly new, just scuffed and covered in mud. The grin on his face widened, exposing pristine white teeth. You shouldn't have run, but I'm glad you did. Vell stepped forward, the plates in his mechanical arm bristling, but a knife appeared in the man's free hand and the point of the blade was pressed against Piper's neck. His grin split into a tawdry snarl. Now, now, back off. He gestured with the tip of his knife. Chester wants the both of you kept alive, but if you're not careful, she could end up needing stitches. Vell halted, taking a step back and lifting his hands. Whoa, listen, we weren't running. We... Help, pervert! Piper's scream surprised Vell as much as the individual threatening her. The man pulled the blade away a few inches, looking around nervously at all the eyes that had just turned to look in their direction. An anxious chuckle escaped his mouth as he stammered. <laughs> what? No, I never. Let go of me, you sicko! Piper, throwing her act into high gear, struggled against the man's grip. She still had it, she thought, as several patrons of the street started stalking their way. One of them, a burly red-scaled dragon man, picked up a discarded section of wood and began smacking it against his open palm. The man with the knife let go of her arm and started backpedaling, his face going pale white. No, this, this isn't what you think. We know each other. I... As the mob began to close in around her assailant, Piper slipped between outstretched arms and grabbed Vel by the coat sleeve. She tugged him in the opposite direction, down another alley. I told you running was a bad idea. Vel replied with an indignant huff. No need to rub it in. Piper chuckled a little, and, as the shouts began to fade behind them, slowed to a walking pace. She motioned for the cyborg to follow suit. Let's avoid attracting any farther attention. Sorry about that. I guess my sense of direction really isn't that great after all. Mel offered a slight grimace to his AI. I surmise my margin for error is far less than yours. Piper shrugged. It's not like I had any better ideas. At least it worked. They stepped out of the alley and were thrust back into the bustle of the market street. Vel gave the crowd a cursory glance before stepping in line with the moving people. A shuffle of footsteps caused him to look around, expecting the burly man with the knife. Instead, 
his eyes landed on the young man, who spun on the spot and did his best to appear interested in the fine fabrics a woman at a tent was peddling. Vel sighed and nudged Piper. She looked in the direction he indicated. Seriously? Again? She prodded the stitch in her side. I don't think I can run anymore. Vel looked around at the crowded street. A flash of feathery pink boa caught his attention, and a smile broke over his face. Do you still have some of that coin you, uh, obtained the other day? Piper followed his gaze. Listen, Gramps, now is really not the time for that. What? They looked from Piper to the horde of scantily clad dragon women ahead of them. No, it's... His face formed a scowl. I have an idea. He gestured wordlessly with a flex of his fingers into an open palm. Piper's mouth curled into an ugly pout. You can just acquire more later. Do you want to get out of here? Piper huffed through her nose and deposited a handful of coins into Vel's hand. She watched as he marched over to the gaggle of working girls with a confident stride. There was some giggling, a forced laugh, and a rumble of low conversation. He returned a moment later, his cheeks a little redder, and a grin tugging at his mouth. Let's go. Vel put a hand on her shoulder and steered her around the group of tittering dragon women. He gave her a gentle push, nudging her into a nearby alley and falling in line behind her. The sudden commotion from the street was almost enough cause to pull Piper away from the cyborg to see what had happened. But his grip was firm, and they turned down another alley. She looked up at him, curiosity filling her gaze. What did you do? I told them it was our friend's birthday, and that he has an affinity for being tied up. I don't know what they're doing, but let's hope they keep him occupied. Piper grinned despite herself. Not down that way. I'll take you back to the slums. She shrugged his hand off her shoulder and glanced around. Your sense of direction really is horrible. I am an artificially intelligent, mathematically engineered entity, not a GPS. Bill's face twisted in astonishment. Amy, huh? Didn't know you had a name. You never asked. Piper looked up. The shadow of the floating metropolis was ever-present but it was also a great way to get your bearings. There, just on the edge of her vision, she could make out the bottom of a moored dirigible. She turned around to see the cyborg still back at the mouth of the alley. She gestured to the air with a hand and said, This way, old man. The lifts from the ground level were a stark reminder to Vel that they were no longer in the aviary district. The rickety platform creaked and groaned as it crept up towards the airship docks. Piper had turned away from the railing, ducking into him a little, no longer a fan of heights. He, however, found the dizzying cityscape below easier to deal with than their current claustrophobic and suffocating situation. Several babies were crying, fighting with one another to be heard over the sound of livestock and heated arguments between merchants and sailors. The platform was littered with straw and smelled strongly of mildew. Combined with the lingering scent of wet fur, animal dung, unwashed bodies, and caustic spices, it was enough to make anyone's eyes water. The lift itself jerked and wobbled as a team of squat equine creatures turned a massive gear crank below. After what seemed like a small eternity, the elevator rattled to a stop and the metal gates swung open allowing the throng of people to spill outwards, fighting to escape the lift faster than everyone else. Vel pried his mechanical hand away from the rail, revealing several indentations from where his fingers had been gripping. He took a steadying breath, only to be hit hard with the noxious fumes. That was... harrowing. Harrowing? That was bloody terrifying! Let's get off before this thing falls apart! Piper lurched a step and held a hand up to her mouth. It was rocking so bad I think I'm seasick. On either side of the lift was the rear wall of the docks, made from a tall series of metal panels that stretched from one end of the area to the other, hiding the lattice of support beams which held the massive platform aloft. Laid out before them were the docks themselves. Positioned halfway between the ground and the floating city allowed for a wide variety of passengers and sailors alike to mingle with one another. 
even though the classier pleasure vessels were segregated from the rest of the ships by ropes and military personnel, Vel could see this was the only area in the city where the rich came so close to those of the lower classes. The ships themselves, much like in Silverport, were equally varied in size and design. Some were massive frigates, loading up soldiers to take to the front lines. Others were large clipper ships, ferrying goods and passengers. There were schooners, tugboats, skiffs, and even something that reminded Vel of a Viking longboat. Their balloons tended to be quite festive, with flags and crests hanging from the lines that secured them in place. Carts laden with crates, barrels, and goods were a constant hazard as they made their way through the madness. Vel was surprised it could be so busy until he realized that this was the lifeblood of the city all in one spot. Everything from the finest gold and silver from the aviary district to goods bought and sold in the no-guard district all flowed through this port. Piper tugged on Vel's coat sleeve. I'll see a few passenger boats over that way. Let's go check it out. Vel looked at the ship she was pointing to. How can you tell? They look just like the ones over here. See the colored flags hanging from the balloons? Those indicate the ship's purpose and schedule. That one there with the red flag out front. She pointed to a large vessel close to where they were standing. The red means they are due to leave in a few hours. The state flag behind it means they are headed to Silverport. And the brown and green pennants mean they are transporting general goods and textiles. Vel looked again at the many ship balloons surrounding them. Sure enough, each one had a similar layout of flags, varying only in the sequence of colors. Huh, interesting. What color means passengers? Piper rolled her eyes. White, of course. And we want one with a yellow schedule flag. That means it's set to leave tomorrow. She squinted across the dock and, after a moment, led the way to a rather basic-looking ship tucked behind a large pleasure vessel. The paint on the hall was chipping, and the balloon was yellowed with age, but it appeared to be in decent working order. From her experience, ships with polished decks and sparkling white sails tended to charge extra for the perceived quality. Why, hello! A portly sailor with a wide, genuine smile waved them aboard. Welcome to the Quimbley, finest ship to ever sail the skies of Avis. My name's Jeb. What can I do for you? Vel reached out and shook his hand. Nice ship. Piper kicked him in the shins and forced her way between the two. Nice ship, but we've seen a lot nicer on our way over here. Jeb raised an eyebrow. Thank you, I think. Piper crossed her arms. Look, Jeb, I need three tickets. Don't matter where you're headed or what the accommodations are like. I can sleep on the deck if I have to, but I need them cheap and I need them fast. Jeb nodded slowly. And no questions asked, I presume? Piper nodded. Smart man, I like you. Jeb scratched at his nose, considering. Well, my standard ticket price is 600 a person, but I know what it's like to be in a bind. If you'd be willing to bunk up in the storage area, I'd be willing to knock that down to 1500 for the lot. Two meals a day included. 1500 Piper's hands dropped to her sides in shock. This ain't exactly a pleasure yacht. You realize that? Jeb shrugged. You're welcome to try somewhere else, but you're not going to find anything better. Since the food shortage, people are leaving in droves. You can almost make more money moving people than goods these days. Six hundred is a bargain, and that's a fact. Piper remained rooted to the spot, her face falling in dismay. She had nowhere near that much money even after her exploits in Avis, and if she couldn't get her brother out. Vel grabbed Piper by the shoulders after several long moments of silence and began steering her towards the ramp back down to the docks. Uh, thank you, Jeb. We'll think about it. Jeb nodded and gave him a friendly wave. Once back on the docks, Piper finally snapped out of it. We're screwed. We are so properly screwed. Vel maneuvered her off to the side, near a collection of wooden crates, and set her down on one. Don't freak out just yet. We'll figure this out. Fifteen hundred! Well, how much have you got right now? Piper shrugged, doing some quick estimation in her head. Maybe half? 
Mel sat down next to her. Okay, so about 750. We might not be able to get the full 15, but if we can get it up to a thousand, we can at least send you and your brother off. And leave you here alone to deal with Chester? He'll have you strapped to a dissection table in under a week. Vel shrugged, watching the throngs of people moving about the docks. I've dealt with worse than Chester. We need to worry about the two of you first. Piper shook her head. You may think that, but Chester owns more people in this city than the High Inquisitor. He's going to kill you. Trust me, if I don't have to stay, I won't. But it's better than all three of us. So, how do we get another 750 with about 17 hours left in the day? I sat in silence, thinking and watching the crowd move in and out like a tide. Piper had accrued half the price of their fare by serial pickpocketing the obscenely wealthy for nearly a week straight. Vel stretched his back. Would anyone be willing to lend us that much? Piper shook her head. No way. And short of robbing a moneylender, I can't think of how to steal it. She was good, but not that good. Vel dragged his mechanical hand down his face as he exhaled through his nose. As they sat, locked in silence and thought, a familiar glowing notification popped up in his field of vision. Suspicious activity detected. Vel was about to wave away the alert and terminate the program when he realized just what his AI was highlighting. Across the way, near the back wall, a uniformed guard had just accepted a sizable purse from a shifty-eyed man with a cart. The guard stepped to the side, and one of the panels of the wall swung open just enough to allow the cart to squeeze through. Vel nudged Piper, indicating the goods disappearing behind the panel. What do you suppose that's about? Piper raised an eyebrow. No idea, but it looks worth investigating. Mel pushed himself up to his feet, nodding in agreement. Even if it wasn't a way to get them out of town, they might be able to shake down the guard to help make up the difference. Upon closer inspection, it was clear this man was from the lower levels. He had none of the fine embroidery on his jacket that his upper-class counterparts so proudly sported. His face also betrayed the look of pure loathing for his job. Just the individual that would break the rules for some quick cash. Piper stepped up first and took the initiative, coughing pointedly to get the guard's attention. The man looked down at her with a mild expression of annoyance. Yeah, what do you want? Piper reached into her pocket and produced a small money pouch, emptying it into her hand and hefting the shiny coins before her. Me and my friend here were hoping to go sightseeing, but none of the usual spots, if you get my meaning. The guard chuckled, then spat on the ground and gave her a flat look. Piss off. Fine. Piper dug into her pocket and added a few more coins to the pile. How much? Look, sweetheart, you ain't got nothing to sell, so you ain't got no business here. The guard put a palm to the hilt of his saber. So get lost. Piper started to retort, but Vel reached out and pulled her back, clamping a hand over her mouth. My apologies, good sir. He pushed Piper to the side and offered his hand to the guard. Who did not take it? Uh, right. See, the thing is, we are merchants. We just... He stammered, unsure where to take the lie. Piper pushed her way back in front. We didn't bring any of our goods with us. We're more of the you-want-it-we-find-it type. The guard looked confused, but still unconvinced. What kind of merchant tries to sell something they don't have? Vettel pushed Piper to the side again. We make custom items. You can't sell it if you don't know what they want. Am I right? The guard gave him a long, scrutinizing look. What kind of custom items? Uh, arms, Piper blurted. Arms? The guard asked, his hand now gripping the sword hilt. You know civilians can't own firearms in Avis, right? Vel hitched up the sleeve of his coat, revealing his cybernetic limb. Uh, arms like body arms, not killing arms. I mean, obviously you could kill stuff with your arms, but not the kind of arms that explode. He chuckled, scratching behind his ear nervously. Well, usually. The guard took a closer look at Vel's prosthetic. Custom augments? 
Well, why didn't you say that? His hand fell away from his sword and his posture relaxed. Entrance fee is 200, and if anyone asks, we never met. Piper stepped back. 200 would put them that much farther from their goal. It was a steep price to pay for a gambit that might not pan out. The guard's eyes narrowed. You won't waste my time, are you? Because as an officer of the law, I might take offense to that. Bell elbowed Piper gently. Of course not. She just has to count it out. Piper begrudgingly pulled out a few more fistfuls of coins, piling it all into the guard's outstretched hands. The guard winked. Pleasure doing business. He poured the money into a leather military pack at his side and knocked on the panel behind him. The sheet of metal swung open a few feet, and the pair ducked inside. A man in grubby work clothes ushered them in, pulling the panel closed behind them. Down the walkway, to the left, keep your hands in the lift at all times, unless you want to lose them. Bill and Piper entered a makeshift hallway of wooden planks haphazardly strapped to the various support beams beneath them. The path wound through sixty feet of low-hanging I-beams and rusty metal before ending abruptly at a rickety platform, just large enough to hold a small cart of goods. With nowhere else to go, they stepped on. There was a rattle of gears from above, and the floor began to slide upwards. It listed heavily to one side, and Vel had to grab hold of Piper to keep her from sliding off. The platform bucked and swayed as it continued its unsteady ascent up into the darkness. Piper grit her teeth and shouted over the sound of grinding metal. I'm going to kill whoever invented these things! Vel dropped to one knee as the platform threatened to kick them off again. I'll hold them down for you! With a final bone-rattling lurch, the platform slammed into a fragile-looking metal dock. The pair leapt off, not wanting to risk being caught if the cable for the lift gave way. Without the deafening grind of turning gears, they could hear what sounded like the chatter of dozens of people filling the silence. Squinting through the dim chamber, they could see a faint glow in the direction of the commotion. Realization set in as Vel turned to face the girl. Is this what I think it is? Piper frowned as she found herself following the cyborg along a curved path towards the glow. What is it? A slow smile crept along Bell's features. A solution to our problem. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles is book two of the ongoing Psy Fantasy series by author Leslie Heron. Join us as the adventure unfolds, with new chapters releasing every few weeks. Hey, computer. I think some weirdo is following me. Do you think you can scan to see if anyone else is acting suspicious? Certainly. Initiating criminal activity for warning algorithms. Scanning. Scanning. Suspicious activity detected. Wow, that was fast. Uh... Okay, that guy is ripping off a carpet salesman. I really don't think that has anything to do with me. Noted. Suspicious activity detected. Yeah, technically you're right, but public urination isn't exactly what I meant. Noted. Suspicious activity detected. Okay, look, I'll admit the man with the trench coat probably didn't buy all those watches legally, but I, I don't need you to... Noted. Suspicious activity detected. I'll admit not tipping a waiter is wrong, but technically it's not a crime. Noted. Suspicious activity detected. W what the hell? You're highlighting me. You were jaywalking. Seriously?